everybody, my name's uh, Brett Mills and I'm really pleased to be uh, chairing this session on streaming and the uh, TV text. Um, so good afternoon, good morning, good evening, good middle of the night, wherever you are from, everyone who's attending. Uh, I'm sure everyone knows the kind of rules of how this stuff works uh, now, uh, but just in case, um, so we have the session today is an hour long, there's two papers, so they're about 20 minutes each. We'll take both papers and then uh, there's time for discussion at the end. Um, obviously, there's the chat function. So if you want to be kind of responding during the talks, then then that, that's a way you can do that. And obviously raising your hand uh, at the end. Cameras off during the presentations. But at the end for the discussion, if you're willing and able to put your camera back on, uh, that would be really nice for the speakers so that they've got people to speak to rather than black boxes. That would be really, really good. Um, and I think that's it. So we might as well just get on with the first paper. So that's, uh, I'll go over to Max Dosser, who's at the University of Pittsburgh, whose title is Streaming Skip Intro Function as a Contradictory Refuge for Television Title Sequences. And Max, I'll pass over to you. All right, thank you so much. Let me try to do the thing that you all liked with my screen sharing. Is it? Can you see my slide? We can, and we can see you in front of it. I love it. All right. Awesome. So I'm going to, there's a link up at the top, but I'm going to drop it in the chat as well. If that goes through, I think it did. Yes. So if you, I, I tend to do minimal slides and rather have my script provided. So you can access the script from that link or up here. Up in the top corner, you can see the script there. But um, so, hi, my name is Max Dosser. This is my presentation: skip streaming, skip intro function as a contradictory refuge for television title sequences. So Monica Bednarak ended her survey of television title sequences with a quote from blogger Andrew Lindstrom. He said, "Today the." credit sequences on television are so visually pleasing that even though we possess the technology to skip past them, we don't. They're that captivating. Lindstrom wrote that in 2009, eight years prior to Netflix introducing the skip intro function, when fast forwarding was the primary means for skipping through an opening sequence. The skip intro function now allows viewers to completely bypass title sequences with a single click. Netflix first introduced the function on its platform in 2017, and it's now a feature of other portals. Despite Lindstrom's claim that audiences were captivated by and watched these title sequences, Annette Davidson notes that viewers of DVD box sets or series recorded on DVR often fast-forwarded through these sequences. While skipping title sequences might have been a common practice prior to 2017, some recent observers have expressed anxiety that the skip intro function will kill the title sequence. Why would a company invest resources to create a title sequence with intricate visuals and memorable music if the audience is offered a skip intro function? The music and accompanying visuals are often designed to attract attention and signal to audiences what the series will be about. Consequently, the loss of the title sequence could very well impact how audiences relate to or experience various series. In this presentation, I challenge the idea that the skip intro function represents the end of title sequences. I argue that as portals give audiences greater control of their televisual flow, they create a space for title sequences, a space that many television critics consider to be already vanishing in the realm of broadcast networks television and ultimately preserve the cultural technology of title sequence. To do so, I first illustrate how the concepts of binge watching and televisual flow interact and how binge watching, as well as a desire to emulate prestige cable network programming, directly influences Netflix's development and adoption of the skip intro function. I then demonstrate how the skip intro function preserves a space for title sequences by providing choice for audiences. The creation of this space reveals how streaming services are embracing a hybrid model of linear and nonlinear television to create a feeling of agency that is increasingly key in post-network television practices. So many television scholars have examined the concept of binge watching. Amanda Lotz describes it as, quote, consuming all the episodes of a season in a matter of days or even hours. Christopher M. Cox calls it, quote, the practice of successively watching blocks of episodic content. And he adds that it is not merely about what television one watches, it's about how one watches. 
Graham Turner argues that the number of episodes consumed is less important for the concept of binge watching, but that it has, quote, become part of everyday social practice within many households. For them now, perhaps, it's just how they watch television. While these different conceptions mention the idea of watching multiple episodes, they are more focused on the control binge watching gives audiences as viewing habits evolve. Binge watching itself is not a new phenomenon, as DVD box sets and DVR technology changed consumption patterns and enabled viewers more control over their viewing schedules before streaming services existed. In fact, binge watching can be understood as self determined viewing. It is the viewer who decides when to watch and what to watch, not the broadcasting schedule. Despite binge watching having pre streaming origins, it has largely been associated with digital on demand platforms that provide instantaneous access to episodic television programs. Binge watching enables active viewing practices as a way of managing one's time in front of the television rather than succumbing to a television schedule. The increased agency in television consumption patterns facilitated through DVD box sets, DVR, and streaming services has led to a reconception of how flow functions in portals. Televisual flow describes the movement from one el element of television to the next, be it from one segment of an episode to another, from advertisement to advertisement, from one show to following, and so forth. While networks were central to the initial theorizations of flow, the concept has been disrupted, transformed, and reevaluated by scholars because of the development of various viewing technologies. Much of the current conversation centers on how one can now locate flow within digital platforms and often urge users to more actively self select content. And through these active capacities, ser service the industrial logics of digital interactivity. While the changes to the programming flow are important, for this presentation, I am more concerned with how binge watching affects flow and influences the preparatory visuals and music of the title sequence. The soundtrack of television is the major mode of mediation between what Raymond Williams calls the programming flow and what Rick Altman terms household flow, where household flow explains how viewers are seldom exclusively watching television, but are rather doing things around their homes while television plays. Both Altman and John Ellis argue that sound, and music in particular, can be used to draw the attention of viewers distracted by household activities back to the television program, whether this be the sound and music in the series' dramatic action or the title theme. Charles Fairchild similarly contends that music does not merely catch the attention, but it maintains the narrative flow within episodes and within series. The title sequence can act as the beginning of the entrance flow, which I see as a liminal space where viewers are ushered into the televisual world. The theme music and visuals of the title sequence are meant to grab viewers' attention and establish themes of the series. They even work to brand the program and the platform. For returning viewers, it may establish a continuity, an opportunity for reintroduction. Aspects of the show's genre or content can be, can be conveyed by various textual and musical elements in a series title sequence. The audiovisual title sequence thus serves an explicit purpose in the flow of television, but as audiences gain greater agency over how they consume television, the skip intro option appears to complicate these functions. Tanya Horick, Marik Jenner, and Tina Kendall argue that, quote, the skip intro function makes, allows us to make the narrative flow se feel more seamless. When one is watching multiple ep episodes successively, the need to be reintroduced to the televisual world is less necessary. Netflix's interface makes sequential viewing much easier than non-sequential viewing, and Netflix's skip intro function often removes the opening credits altogether to make binge watching easier. Do Dojami Baker argues that in a full season epic experience, a long repeated title sequence each episode would seem largely redundant, as the viewer does not need to be reminded that their series is starting, so they may simply skip the opening sequence. Tessa Alves agrees, positing that while watching playback or on-demand television, audiences want the program to start with minimum delay. Netflix and other portals encourage binge watching with the inclusion of the skip intro function, and as such, the functional import of the title sequence in terms of televisual flow is largely reduced as binge watching becomes more common. The growing anxiety in the industry over the looming demise of the introductory music and visuals then is sensible. I, however, now want to challenge the idea that the skip intro function and streaming services are the end of title sequences by illustrating how portals that give audiences greater control of flow create a space for audiovisual title sequences. In conversation with Robert Brookie, Jonathan Gray asks, quote, which paratexts are loud and which paratexts are quiet? Which are the ones we cannot avoid and which are the ones we are more likely to avoid? While not discussing title sequences in particular, these questions have prescience for this presentation. 
as the skip intro function seems to answer Gray's questions. The title sequences are a pair of text we can't avoid, but whether we do so largely depends on the context and on individual audiences. The skip intro function is primarily discussed in relation to binge watching. Critics in television trade press write that, quote, this cool new skip intro button will make binge watching better, that, quote, there's no greater tool than the Netflix binge watcher's belt than the awesome skip intro button, letting you blast past the show's opening credits and get right to the good stuff. And that, quote, most of us would agree that the skip intro button is one of the greatest inventions for streaming services during this generation, especially when binge watching. Many critics praise the skip intro function and view it as a step into the future of television, where television, oh, sorry, where title sequences are extremely short or entirely absent. In 2015, Stuart Heritage argued that title sequences were growing too long and advocated that series should switch to only using title cards. And only a few years later, in 2018, Jack Seal claimed that the TV theme tune is almost dead. But not all the critics view the shift in title sequences as positive. James Lokes, for example, believes that, quote, good themes set the tone for the show and give us something to think about. Skip the intro and you skip the chance to consider such things. Though even Lokes acknowledges that when binge watching, skipping the titles makes sense. The big question then is why would a series have an audiovisual title sequence if there's going to be a skip intro function? Crafting title sequences and theme songs is neither an easy nor a cheap process. So if Netflix and other portals encourage binge watching, why do they expend resources to create introductory music and visuals? Jenner claims that, quote, because binge watching makes the opening sequence at least partially redundant, the function of the opening credits for a Netflix series is predominantly aesthetic. But I disagree. Amor Jean Christian argues that few scholars have examined the ways in which web-based producers have created content that borrowed from genres and formats established in the classic network era, while experimenting with new storytelling and distribution practices from other media and technologies. The title sequence is one of those borrowed aspects of network television that portals do not need to have. Title sequences, however, are more than aesthetics appealing to network television tradition. Theme music in particular serves the dual function of navigating the viewer through the extra diegetic space of the televisual flow by announcing the beginning program and also inviting the viewer into the narrative space or story world of the program. More than just preparing the audiences for the series content, title sequences are a cultural technology that engage audiences in ways that the series itself cannot. A title sequence can establish a brand identity, pose complex questions that the series will attempt to answer, give insight into the series themes, or provide theme music that can be shared outside of the series through singing or humming that can generate conversation and audience interest. The skip intro function, then, rather than eliminating the title sequence, provides a space for these audiovisual sequences to continue to exist, as it gives audiences control over whether they watch the sequences. While many viewers may want to engage with the title sequence when they watch the first episode of the series, the skip intro function allows these longer title sequences to exist, as viewers who binge watch are easily able to skip the sequences if they so choose. By providing viewers with increased control, portals that include the skip intro function allow audiences to further personalize their flow. Technology that increases individual agency for the viewer is considered by the audiences to be a major upgrade in the status of the TV experience. Between autoplaying the next episode, directing viewers from one series to another, and providing viewers with the option either to re-immerse themselves in the television world or skip that, that experience entirely so they can immediately find out what happens next, portals uniquely provide agencies for their audience. The title sequence, while a justifiable skip for many, is necessary for full engagement by others. And as established, while the skip intro function makes it easier for the viewer to forego the title sequence, audiences have been avoiding title sequences for much longer than the skip intro function has existed. Many critics claim that the title sequences were already being phased out of network series by the mid-2000s, and TV historian Tim Brooks estimates that less than 10% of television series had traditional theme songs by 2006. The title sequence had become viewed as an interruption that would lose viewers. The creation and popularization of DVR technology was partially technology, was partially responsible. As, the, as with DVD box sets, the DVR altered the flow of television programming and provided audiences with increased agency. DVRs and DVDs additionally enabled audiences to keep up with series more easily, so they did not need the premise explained to them at the beginning of each episode. 
The changing structure of television programming in this period also led to shorter episode runtimes. The title sequence and theme music were likely seen as justifiable casualties. A recent trend has been to have a longer title sequence for one season or even just a handful of episodes, while later episodes utilize an abbreviated version of the theme that plays over the title card. This is increasingly common in network series such as New Girl and The Mindy Project. Networks are experiencing decreasing viewership numbers, and the shortening or elimination of title sequence is one way they are attempting to address the problem. What is particularly notable about, about this period, however, is that many VFX studios that specialize in creating title sequences, such as Blue Spill and Elastic Pictures, were founded in the mid to late 2000s, after critics claimed title sequences started fading. This is likely because while more networks moved towards using title cards with only a few seconds of theme music, premium cable networks were increasingly the place to find title sequences and theme music. HBO and other cable networks purposefully adopted longer title sequences to distinguish themselves from broadcast networks and to present a prestigious brand identity with intensity in a highly compressed time frame. Because title sequences were less common in broadcast television series, but were still a key part of films, highly produced title sequences could be seen as a marker that these premium cable networks were more than television. Portals and their attempts to mimic quality cable networks followed suit by creating longer title sequences for their original series, even as they introduced the skip intro function. One reason the extended and higher quality sequences exist on premium cable networks and streaming services is that they don't have the same restrictions as broadcast networks. Without commercials or mandated episode lengths, their series can have lengthy title themes. Many of these longer and more involved sequences are created for streaming services that utilize the skip intro function. By incorporating this function into their interfaces, portals enable themselves to participate simultaneously in cable and broadcast trends. The title sequences produced by portals often mirror, mirror the sequences of quality television series on HBO and Showtime. Jenner has even demonstrated that title sequences on a streaming service can signal a different experience from the actual series. This illuminates how important title sequences have become in denoting the quality of the series and by extension, the portal or network. The skip intro function, however, also allows portals to follow the trajectory of networks like NBC, Fox, and ABC by not forcing audiences to watch drawn out title sequences before consuming the series. This is especially useful when binge watching multiple episodes at once, as the sequences could be seen as interrupting the flow of episodes and disrupting audience engagement. While many viewers may choose to watch the title sequence before each episode, it is not a requirement on streaming services. Through the implementation of the skip intro function, streaming services both fit the historical trajectory of the title sequences by enabling audiences to consume media without the interruption of the title sequence and simultaneously preserve the space for these title sequences to exist. By presenting audiences with options for how to engage with title sequences, the skip intro function enables the title sequence to retain its function as an important television paratext while also allowing audiences to watch multiple episodes without having to be re-invited into the story world. So to conclude, in this presentation, I have argued that the skip intro function provides a space for title sequences by giving users the ability not to watch them. In many ways, this feels like a contradiction, as the function that enables one to skip titles is the function that appears to be saving them. Can title sequences be simultaneously skippable and worthy of being saved? Perhaps more important is the question of why preserve them? Is there something essential to the television experience about the title sequence? In many ways, maybe not, as network television has been moving away from traditional title sequences and towards brief title cards since the mid-2000s. Yet, title sequences are vital, not only to grab the attention of the audience, but to convey information. Cable networks attempting to set themselves apart from broadcast networks and to model their aesthetics on film became the primary place to find theme songs and title sequences. Streaming services, in an attempt to appear as quality television, imitated the more prestigious cable networks, but streaming services also have the ability to upend linear scheduling and give audiences control of their viewing schedules. In encouraging binge watching, portals provide a function that allows viewers to skip title sequences, but they continue to offer the option to consume them if the viewer wishes. While consuming the title sequence before each episode may not be essential to the viewing experience, particularly if a person is viewing many episodes in quick succession, succession as televisual flow becomes increasingly personalized, the ability to choose whether one interacts with these paratextual sequences is vital. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Max. That was uh, that was great, and I can see lots of people uh, reacting with uh, clapping there. So that's that's really really great. Um, uh, and as I said earlier, if there's comments, feedback, questions, you can be putting those in the chat as the talks are taking place, and I'll come to those uh, at the end if you want to do that. But now I'll uh, pass over to uh, Kim Karina Heaven, who's at the Royal University of Bochum and Technische Universität in Dortmund. Uh, and her talk is titled, Are You Still Watching TV? Virtual Reality as Temporary Manifestation of Post Television. And so I'll pass over to you, Kim. You're muted. Okay, I muted uh, myself again. Um, <laughs> I can hear you now. My presentation, thank you for the introduction. Okay. Um, yep, we can see that. Okay, and I will switch into presentation mode. We already tried that. Okay, um, yes, uh, so introduction, experiments, um, innovations and false starts. The network era, television 2.0, post TV, one TV set in the living room, streaming television on portable devices and immersive gear. These paradigmatically selected milestones show that television was always known to reinvent itself. It has included the newest technologies and devices ever since its beginnings. Television's current media landscape is ambivalent, convergent, and immersive. It is experimental. And at first view, some phenomena uh, are not even considered to pass it as television. In this talk, I would like to highlight virtual reality experience as recent outliers of post-television studies. VR equipment, such as glasses or gloves, is not considered conventional gear for watching television. Yet it is of importance to analyze how VR and television interrelate. This correlation between TV and VR is not only an example of media convergence or remediation, but it reveals television's true nature, namely its ongoing transformation. To understand the interrelation between TV and VR, it is important to take a look at their developmental histories, which are closely connected. It was only after television became a mass medium that um, expe expectations, needs and skills of the audience or user were in equal parts driving forces that transformed and merged television and technical innovations like VR. Simultaneously, the audience adapts to these new formats and practices. TV's history is a history of interactions. Television always answered to the audience's needs. It has never been just a medium for one-way communication. Technological inventions in the late 1950s, like the remote control or the VCR, delivered solutions for the appearance of the increase of new broadcasting networks and channels. Channels. Programming and formats got more complex and rewatchability became a new aspect to consider in production and writing. Finally, the merge of social media in the early 2000s led to an interactive state that was declared the new television 2.0. We can, uh, what can be discussed as outliers of television studies are the many false starts that interactive television as well as VR technology endured in the last 70 years. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, beginning in uh, the 1950s and 60s, the idea of video telephony emerged, combining a TV set with a telephone. But ultimately, the picture phone um, failed because most people felt uncomfortable at the idea of being seen during a telephone conversation. Um, this is very similar to companion apps on second screens, which had their peak performance not until the early 2010s. In the 1980s, telephone and broadcast companies merged once again and launched projects like the Viewtron, which was way ahead of its time. 
The Butron was a complex version of teletext based on a box that could, quote, um, connect the telephone line to the television set. It offered, quote, games, several different forms of communication, frequent updates of information like the weather, flight information, and even online banking, and contents control, end of quote. Um, but it was withdrawn from the market before it could reach any appreciation because the pricing for the box and the subscription were too high. Moreover, the audience was not ready for this kind of interaction and this massive change of the medium once known as television. All these inventions have in common that they failed. Nevertheless, the invention of the television display and its urge to be interactive and to emerge uh, with new media and technologies were crucial for the development of virtual reality. The history of VR, and by that I mean the experience of placing the user into a virtual world, starts as early as in the 1960s with the invention of the sensorama. The sensorama was able to, quote, create a fully immersive multi-sensory theater experience that encompassed 3D images, stereo sound, wind, smells, and vibrations. There were five films available. One of them, quote, a motorcycle ride through New York City that included a seat that would vibrate as a motorbike would, hair that would rush through the user's hair, and smells of the road and a passing wisp flow, end of quote. It was an entirely immersive experience, which was even more ambitious and sophisticated than what is our current status quo when using and thinking of VR experiences. Yet it lacked moments of interactivity. This prototype and the increasing convergence of media led to more advanced inventions like head-mounted gear that can be declared as the modern age of virtual reality. And here again, television technology was crucial for the uprising of VR. In uh, 1960, the inventor of the sensorama, Morton Heilig, had a patent for another VR device, the Telesphere mask, which consisted of a hollow casing, a pair of optical units, a pair of united television tubes, a pair of phones, and a pair of discharge nozzles. Simultaneously, the head-mounted display headset was developed. Um, but virtual reality became and remained an arcade game attraction. It was not until 30 years later, in the 1990s, that we have first entered the mainstream entertainment sector and the homes of its users. In the 1990s, large gaming companies such as Sega or Nintendo developed handy and relatively affordable head-mounted devices to play console games on. But they all ultimately flopped because um, the quality of the technology wasn't there yet. It is noteworthy to mention that these prototypes and early inventions were destroyed and forgotten over the years. It was just until nearly 10 years ago, in the 2010s, that uh, a new interest in VR gear sparked and the development of a new wave of production started. Approximately five years ago, we reached the peak of transmedia storytelling. VR is always referred to as experience because it is highly participative and immersive. Concurrently, there's a transition from watching te television to experiencing it, or even playing it. Besides its frequent occurrence as an addition to TV, VR is also a standalone video game genre. Hence, it is necessary to study how television and gaming affect each other. VR practices such as 360-degree videos or alternate, uh, uh, augmented reality visual effects were, and still are, easily accessible a smartphone or browser applications with no additional technology needed. One way to experience VR is with the help of a simple card box construction, uh, construction and YouTube. I have a cardboard uh, VR glasses right here. You just put your uh, smartphone in front of it. Uh, the audience is not watching exclusively in the living room anymore. It is browsing through streaming platforms, archives, and social media in search of flow-like entertainment that uh, I am going to analyze through the lens of television studies. 
However, most of these virtual reality extensions are gone now. They are only accessible through web archives that can restore deleted websites. We are now within a literal virtual state. And it's fair to ask the question whether virtual reality as an extension to television has failed again. Let's have a look at some contemporary examples as we already uh, do. Um, one great example to show several milestones of interactive television is NBC's The Walking Dead, which had its peak a few years ago. It is still airing, but will probably end within this year. Most of its interactive um, augmented reality, 360-degree and virtual reality extensions are offline, like uh, Alexandria, what we are watching right now. It's um, a video I made in 2015. Um, and the website is completely offline. Um, if you don't know them from five years ago, you will not find any trace of them on NBC's current page. There have been several 360 immersive web exclusive videos that allowed the viewer to, to take a first person perspective into the fictional world. And there was a VR tour through one of the show settings, the royal town of Alexandria. This location was completely accessible and offered different modes of exploration. It strongly resembled Google Street View and the franchise's Telltale Games. It was possible to explore it with VR glasses or uh, in a 360-degree environment on your 3D screen. It had simple quests and explorable objects. You were able to interact with your surroundings and choose your own path and thereby walk the same streets as the show's characters. Intriguingly, NBC shut down this way of immersing with the show and characters, although The Walking Dead uh, has not aired its final episode yet. What is even more remarkable is that Netflix and Amazon Prime's VR contents fell short in comparison. To my knowledge, Netflix does not even offer any original uh, VR content yet. It just enables the viewer to watch any content with VR gear within a virtual living room on a virtual screen. Prime's VR playground is a little bit more elaborate. Here you have an explorable environment and a small selection of the original VR content. But still, no way of interaction or immersion like in VR games or even uh, like in the tour of Alexandria we just watched. But we are is not dead yet. The European Culture Channel, ARTE, a public service television station, offers a wide array of digital productions, including immersive creations and experiences like video games, social media exclusives, and VR 360 degree and uh, augmented reality productions. They regularly release new VR content. However, for some reason, they stopped supporting or updating several videos on the archive as well. There's a shift in production from VR television content like documentary series or fictional series and short films to animated video games. Perhaps the technology still isn't there yet to make enjoyable live action VR productions. Live action content often lacks moments of interaction. The immersion is based on uh, visuals alone. Animated worlds are easier to interact and play with. You can alter them with your actions. Animated worlds, uh, sorry, um, they unfold and change around you. Following this line of thought, VR works best on its own merits. Watching a TV show with VR devices or simply adding VR elements to pre-existing content does not bring the ultimate experience of immersion and interaction. A VR guide describes this uh, phenomenon as follows. While viewing a regular 3D or even a 2D or even a 3D movie on a VR headset will give you a more engaging and exciting experience when compared with watching through the flat screen of your regular TV set, you'll find that a fully immersive by a VR film offers something incredible. Tailored to the specific demands of the software, each virtual reality experience is engaging, interactive, and really makes the viewer feel a part of the action. Something which simply isn't possible even with the very best 3D graphics and filmmaking. 
So, is we are just one almost overcome milestone in television's history of interactive features? The hype it generated is likely over. But let's have a look and see for ourselves um, how to engage with VR television content. YouTube seems to be essential to accommodate VR content. The platform serves as an extension to television channels, as an archive, as a stage to produce original content. It promotes VR as a practice and educates on how to watch and create virtual reality. The network work, uh, the TV networks work closely with the former self-broadcasting uh, platform and produce web and YouTube exclusive elements. Arte often uses YouTube as a co-platform to host its VR productions. Um, we will now watch and experience uh, different types of VR content. I will only show one and the other I will, uh, I will post into the chat and you can experience it on your own. I will guide us through the first uh, example. I would like to point out some of the technical features. I am using this VR content on my laptop, so it works with my mouse. I could also use it with my trackpad. It's a 360 degree technology and it's also available in 3D. Um, I could, and I could also use it with my um, cardboard VR device, and then I would um, see a split screen and I could um, move it uh, and I could explore the environment with the movement of my head instead of um, with uh, dragging my mouse across the screen. Um, as you scroll, scroll around, you can get lost easily. And then you have find your way back to the perspective you need. Um, but it is also your choice which part of the screen you like to explore and what actions you like to follow if there are several actions happening at the same time. Okay, sorry, now I will switch back to my presentation. Yes, the, the second example which, uh, that you will explore on your own um, is a little bit busier. There are different actions happening in one room at the same time, and um, there is on screen text um, like uh, text messages um, all at the same time in the same room, and you must decide which perspective and camera angle you choose to watch. Every viewer creates their own path and experience, so every single run of this content is unique. It's crucial to include the context in which a virtual experience is embedded. The same interactive experience can be a television text and a video game at the same time, varying on who's interacting with it and what kind of platform and uh, what goals or interests they pursue. To watch television means to surf the internet, follow narratives, switch between various platforms and devices, interact and participate with content, and immerse into virtual reality. TV has left the family circle. It has left the living room and it has even left the building. It cannot be contained within the boundaries of one device. It is omnipresent and it impacts our understanding and handling of media in general. Although VR doesn't seem to be the new way to watch television, it shows how meaningful TV is as a medium and as an institution and how it impacts technological innovation. Conclusion, false, false starts as a paradigm. It is not productive to discuss whether VR is a part of television, but to reassess the findings of our perception of television as a medium regarding its outliers. TV is a medium that evokes change and innovation. There are only outliers in television studies, but not in the institution itself, as TV is defined through its false starts 
ongoing transformations and the innovation that it promotes. Therefore, we need to stop describing TV's history by eras or milestones and start to emphasize TV's constant remediation as its defining feature. Thank you. Um, okay, now I, okay, um, I stop sharing and I will share the link with you. In a bit. Have <laughs> you got it there? Thank you, Kim. I'll just give you a moment to put that in the in the chat. Yeah. And while you're doing that, um, uh, I'll invite everyone who's here, if you're willing and able, to put cameras on. As I said at the beginning, it's nicer in the discussion afterwards for Kim and Max if there's faces that they can see. If you're able to do that, that would be great. Uh, there you go, Kim, that's in the chat. Thank you so much. And thank you to both of you for sticking to time as well. That's great. So that gives us just over 15 minutes to have a chat. Um, and so uh, I'll ask everyone questions, comments, responses. You can raise hands or put something in the chat and I shall come to you. Any questions or comments? Elena, I'll come to you first. Me? Yeah, Elena? Yep. Yeah, great. Yeah, Annie, sorry, I'm reading no what's with. It looks like Elena. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing <laughs> it. It's the same name, no, don't worry at all. Um, so I'll, I'll break the ice then. Um, thank you very much both. That was really, really interesting. And it's been a really enjoyable uh, conference as, as, so far, what I've seen. Um, so um, this is a sort of common question for Max. Uh, I'm so glad you've, um, I saw something about TV title sequences in, and in particularly the um, challenges in this, in this new streaming world. I have, um, I have a, a piece of assessment for my students, which is the, that they need to create their own TV title sequence. They make it, they produce it. And what comes with that is the kind of, we have, a lot of them are, you know, YouTube. But they, they've never acquired acquired TV set, and um, what um, uh, actually comes out a lot, or so a lot of the time, out of these conversations and the reflections, is um, as you said, one of the things the agency is the fact that, you know, the that that space that uh, title sequences give uh, is a kind of a breathing space, it allows you to sort of, you know kind of stay for a bit or not or you know just gives you something to to kind of um even that 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 click that when you skip the intro that's a, a kind of a bit of urgency but uh, i guess what my, my question is um what have you and, and it you know there, there's lots of uh, things there about agency and what you said about the flow and the household flow and the programming flow and all that but uh, i my question is, how does all this, have you thought how does this all applies to children's television and children's viewing? Because I think it's quite a fascinating um, thing there. I've been interested in that uh, because of my own kids, but it's like, you know, you just watch them and they they really, they're YouTube kids, a lot of them, and title sequences do not kind of, don't necessarily mean much but at the same time they watch other things i know for my daughter and television television title sequences that are really important to them and um so i don't know have you thought about that particular niche kind of area of children's tv tele, children's tv viewing and streaming yeah so that's that's a wonderful question thank you so much for that um i i've wrote mo like so the thing that I didn't get to in the paper was I like created a history to talk about how they've evolved since the Lone Ranger and I didn't do with any children's series that's something that I want to do because I watched the show Kipo and the Wonder Beast on Netflix which is like meant for children but I love because I love cartoons and at the one thing I noticed was that the the title sequence, you hear the music the whole time, and then at the end of the show, they play the music again with a song on top of it. So it like kind of 
shows this like development of the series through this theme song that's kind of been developing alongside the characters. And I was like, this is something that I'd like to think more about, but I haven't done that yet. But this, this comment makes me want to like put other things on pause and dive more into that. So thank you for that. Um, Elka, you had your hand up next, but you've put it down. Are you should, should I come to you? Okay, okay, I won't come to you then. Um, and so then I'll come to you, and uh, I'm apologising immediately in case I mispronounce your name. Sorry, is it Joy Me? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Oh, well done, uh, Brett. Yes, it is Joy Me. Um, okay, all right, you're next. Um, hey, Max, um, and hey, Kim. Thank you both for your presentations. Uh, Kim, just a comment. I, I really like this idea of not eras or milestones in TV, but a constant process of remediation being core to, to TV. I thought that was a really interesting way to, to frame it in relationship to, to TV. Um, Max, I, I did have a question for, for you. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting tension in, in, in that the idea of a liminal space where you, you have some agency to in a very small way, choose your own adventure as to what that experience is going to be like. And, and you mentioned binge viewing as being one of the factors, you know, that if we're watching episode after episode of the same show, we might choose to watch the first title sequence, but we're less likely to watch it every episode. And I just wondered, you know, what other factors do you think feed into that decision making? So, you know, the binge viewing one is the one that perhaps the most scholarship is around, but, but what else might influence that decision? I know that's perhaps a slightly different question because it's more about, I don't know, perhaps actually audience studies, but I'd be interested to get your thoughts all the same. Yeah, thank you for that. That's, a, that's another great question. And in the paper, I primarily do talk about binge watching, but what you described, I think, I like I do that when my wife and I, watch television, we'll skip the intro after the first one that we watch. But we generally always watch the first one, unless it's one that we don't like or one that we feel is too long. So, like, the one that comes to my mind was Boardwalk Empire. Boardwalk Empire has a pretty long and, like, uninteresting, I guess. Like, that's maybe not the nicest thing to say, but I don't really like that one. So I would skip it when I watched it just because even if it was the first episode, because I was like, I'm not really getting anything out of this one. So I think maybe that comes down to, like you're saying, like audience studies, more individual audiences. What are we interested in? Is this a sequence like The Flight Attendant or Mad Men, where we're seeing like these silhouettes doing adventurous things? Or is it something like Orange is the New Black, where we just see faces and we hear the song and that's a song we can listen to elsewhere. So maybe we're not as interested in engaging with that we've seen it once we can skip past it so i think it often comes down to the individual audience what they want and what they're interested in because maybe some people love seeing steve buscemi stand on a beach but other people like me maybe not so much thanks max elka you put your hand back up again so i'll come to you now uh, yes, because I think the question has finally come together in my head. That's why. So um, thank you both for this, these really good papers. And they, they did make me think a little bit more about methodology, if anything else, because I think that um, the two of you have both looked at television in a way that not many of us do. So, you know, when we talk about title sequences, we usually talk about title sequences in relation to the programme itself, rather than taking them out and just looking at them and, and looking at them across different programs. Similarly, Kim, your your paper really, really emphasised how, you know, you have that continuation um, in terms of technological development because you looked at something outside of what we normally think of as television. So, um, so, so I wanted to ask both of you, in a way, what you think um, television studies needs to do a bit more of, considering your findings, in terms of methods. Um, because we do have, I mean, the, television studies is quite nicely, quite interdisciplinary, obviously, and methodologically quite varied. But nevertheless, there is a tendency sometimes to focus very strongly on the text and to, to look at the program text. You know, Robert has written about this really beautifully about the, the big picture approach um, in, in television studies. But what do you think we should do 
as television scholars in order to see the bigger picture actually of television as a medium. Kim, do you want to go first on that? If I can come to you first, is that all right? Yes, and I raised my hand because I wanted to add uh, something to um, Max, but uh, yes, I will answer that first. Um, I really like uh, to uh, use uh, the approach of post-television. It's really broad, so everything can be uh, analyzed as television, but it's it's quite in interesting. Um, that's why um, I, I watch media archives like the, the websites of uh, HBO, NBC, or Arte, or even YouTube as extension to television because it's really closely connected. So every huge network has its own channel on YouTube. And um, it's why in, in my paper I, I wrote YouTube, the former uh, self-broadcasting network, because that was the slogan, broadcast yourself. But that's nowadays it's more like TikTok and Instagram for broadcasting yourself and not YouTube. And um, even Instagram and TikTok always recur to television because Instagram now has reels and stories and live and um, it's always um, it, it goes uh, to appointment TV to binge watching to liveness to rewatchability it's uh, it's um, always all there so it's really yeah method is really important to bring all that uh, in in one theory but I think um, the post television approach yes it's Everything is uh, can be analyzed as television, but uh, that works for me. Can I, can I, I just ask Max before oh, you respond? Can I can I do a follow up just quickly to Kim Beans as what you just said before I come to you? Does that mean I'm I'm going to be I'm going to push on that a bit? Are we so far post television that we don't need television studies anymore, Kim? Which is what I don't know if that's what you kind of is a is a kind of extrapolation of what you just said. Then, if if all of this stuff is coming together, actually, should we forget television studies and it just becomes media studies or something else? No, not at all. That's uh, what I said in in my paper was that television is like the driving force for every medium, like um, the Viewtron, the teletext is like a precursor for the personal computer, and it was important for the invention of VR and um, uh, television. Always aimed to be interactive, and um, it, it, I think it's a merger. All media um, developed at the same time, quite uh, simultaneously. Um, yes, an, another way to uh, to analyze TV is uh, through the lens of, of play and game. Like if we see the, the ongoing convergence and transformation as a um, kind of experiment, it's uh, always um, a variation um, of, uh, so it's uh, like remediation, but we are always playing with the media and we are always looking what does the audience need but the audience needs what uh, the technology offers. And if there's a new technology, media and the television wants to include it. And it often, very often failed, but it always tries it again. Okay, thank, thank you. That's a, that's a but, really... but I think it's an argument pro television studies. So we <laughs> okay. to analyze media. Okay, that's good. We'll carry on with the conference then. Um, so, uh, Max, I'll pass to you. All right, I don't. I am. Um, I'll say up front that I don't think my answer will be nearly as good as Kim. I feel like I, like I've entered television studies in an era, and it's very possible that like my answer will be like, oh, we used to do that all the time, but and it's just like fallen out of vogue. But I wrote a paper that I've had trouble finding a home for because it was very much about fans. And a lot of my work is about fan studies, which deals with a lot of ethnography and autoethnography and these things. And I was very struck by Charles Fairchild just describing himself watching television. And I feel like in this conference, a lot of the questions and a lot of the things we've said has been prefaced by when I watch this or when I engage. So a lot of it is like very self-referential. So I would just love to see more, you know, engagement with the audiences and fans themselves of these programs and how that impacts their experience of television, which, you know, may be something that people have been doing forever and I'm just not reading the right journals, but. 
Are there any more questions or responses? There's a question I want to ask, but, I, but I'd rather other people do if, if there are other questions. So I'll just check. OK, I wanted to ask about kind of embedded in both of your talks was this idea of developments of new kinds of technology uh, and so on, and the ways in which those exist in discourses of empowerment, that audiences are empowered through uh, through VR and through skipping title sequences. And I don't know, I just kind of think whenever I skip a title sequence, I don't feel massively empowered. And, and so it kind of, and I suppose I'm wondering about the ways in which we have inadvertently taken up that language, which a set of industries have given us to use. They talk about us being empowered doing that stuff, and we seem to have taken that on. And it raises this question of how we understand ideas of empowerment and power relations in terms of television. So I know you were both using those words because the technologies we, you were using use those words. But it'd be interesting to hear about that. Do you think, Max, it is, is skipping a title sequence empowering? What do we mean when we kind of say that? And similarly, Kim, the kind of extra textual stuff that you're talking about that, is that a form of empowerment? What are we meaning by power here? Kim, do you want to go first? Or? Uh, um, so I want to refer to, to a, a paradigm of game theory. It's a game is um, free movement within um, a, uh, um, a closed structure and an example of that is um, uh, Black Mirror's Bandersnatch. I wrote an article on um, that and you feel really empowered because you choose uh, the, the content and you choose the path and um, the story but it's uh, just um, like a, a closed level. It's not even open world play um, you are just within the structures. So you can just choose A or B and um, the peak of transmedia storytelling is even similar because um, you know there is a, there are paratexts out there, and um, so you have like um, like a to do. You you think I have to watch it. I have to uh, master all the paratexts, and you are empowered because you leave the television text, but you also um, are driven by the producers because they want you to watch the paratexts. Max, do you want uh, to add something? Yeah, yeah. I um, I may have said power in mine. I, I try to phrase it more as agency, just for the fact, and maybe to some people that's equivalent, like we are empowered to have agency. But I guess, like, power is a complicated thing, particularly when we are just consuming what people are giving us and we are choosing how we consume it, right? So we're still being fed what they want us to be fed if we so choose to consume it. So I don't know if I, yeah, it's a um, complicated question. Because you did, you're like, you're feeding into what they want you to, like you're drinking the Kool-Aid kind of is what you're saying. So I I don't know if I have a great answer to that. I'm, I'm sorry. I think that the agency is that, like I don't feel powerful when I skip a title sequence, but I also feel like, hey, I have the slightest bit of control over my viewing habits and I have no control in any other aspects of my life. So this is something I can do. Okay, get the agency and power wherever you can. Um, that's good to know. Uh, we're out of time, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, I'll just, in case you haven't seen it, Kim, there's a, there's a comment from uh, Charlotte in the chat. Uh, so I just want to make sure you'd seen that before before we end this. But yeah, we, we better finish on time uh, because I'm right on I Elka. The next session is in 15 minutes. Um, so yeah, I'll just quickly plug that. So the next session in 15 minutes, which is a roundtable on the TB dictionary. So hope to see as many of you as possible there. But uh, of course, what we should do first is thank uh, Max and Kim so much for two really, really interesting talks and really thoughtful responses to questions and comments. So uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. And thank you, everyone. And Brett thank and Elka. Thank you. thank you for having us. There isn't anything you need to announce, is there, Elka? I think most people have left now anyway. So <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Uh, okay. My 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 thing wasn't working very well. I was trying to to um to just uh, copy over the link as always, but it's not working. Ignore me. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. And the next. And, and, and yeah, and Kim, thanks for introducing me to the Sensorama, which I I did not know about at all. Do you I know? Had fun um, looking up all these inventions. Do you know if there is one physically anywhere? Can you see one anywhere in some museum or something? Oh, I think uh, in uh, Universal Studios. Oh, really? Okay. Well, if, if it's it's Rome, there, Rome. but um, that uh, was what the text said that it um, um, that uh, they put it in different uh, locations like Times Square or a Universal Studios and then it became an arcade attraction and then it was uh, shut down. But perhaps in Universal Studio 